Hi everyone, thank you for joining today's webinar focusing on 2019 year-end tax planning, deductions, equipment purchases, and overall tax strategies and updates. My name is Adam, Content Marketing Specialist with Henry Schein, and I'll be your moderator for today's presentation. If at any point during the presentation you have questions, please type them into the questions section of your control panel and we will be sure to cover them at the end of the webinar. Please make sure that your volume is up and any large computer appliances are closed to ensure a smooth connection. This webinar is presented by Henry Schein Dental and no CE credits are being offered for attending this presentation. Our speaker today is Mark Rosen, CPA, CFP, and partner at Rosen & Associates, LLP. Thank you, Mark, for being here today and we look forward to your insightful presentation. Hi, uh, welcome. Thank you very much for joining me uh, on tonight's webinar. Uh, Speaking about 2019 year-end tax planning, deductions, equipment purchases, overall tax strategies, and updates. So we're getting ready to go. We've got about an hour um, to talk about different things. Exciting to me, maybe not that exciting to you, but thanks for joining. We'll kind of go step by step and hopefully give you some tidbits as year-end approaches and, and different things we can go through. So first of all, a little bit about myself again. My name is Mark Rosen. I'm a partner at Rosen Associates. We focus exclusively in the dental industry, servicing about 800 dental practices throughout New England, you know, doing accounting, bookkeeping, taxes. Uh, I'm also obviously involved in different other aspects of the dental industry. Uh, so hopefully it gives you a little background on me and, and we'll get going here. All right, so in order to first look at tax planning and understanding things, we need to first understand how the tax brackets work. So in the last couple of years, with the new tax planning changes, the brackets changed a little bit. And so in order to get into planning, in order to understand where we can save taxes, we first have to look at the brackets. So people all the time say, you know, how much money did you make? And what tax bracket are you in? People say, oh, I'm in the highest tax bracket. But in reality, if you look at it, you're not in the 37% bracket or the 35%. You need to go step by step in order to get to that bracket. And so we, if we look at the married filing jointly column, you can see that all the way up to 32%, it is double the single, okay? So at single filer at 32%, you're gonna cap out your income at 204,000 and then married filing jointly at 408. So then the piece above that is then get taxed at 35%. However, if you can look at that 35% line, you'll see that 612,000 in the married filing jointly column is not double 510. So you do get, I won't say penalized, but it's, it's, you catch up to those higher tax brackets a lot quicker. And you're gonna see in future slides that that makes a difference. Because when we're starting to make bigger purchases and dropping income at different spots or, you know, or not, you're, you're hitting different tax levels sort of quicker. So one of the keys that we want to understand is, is which bracket am I in and how do I look at tax planning and projections? So here's an overview of the different topics and strategies that we're going to go through over the next hour or so. Okay, and feel free, obviously, ask questions along the way. Hopefully we'll might take a peek during the webinar. Otherwise, at the end, we'll try to hit on them. But tax planning and projections, this time of year, you should be in contact with your CPA. Hopefully it's a dental CPA, someone that focuses on the industry. But if you only talk to your CPA during tax time, then you may want to reconsider because lots of these things that we're going to go over are things that you need to take place, that have to take place before the end of the year in order to give you that tax benefit you want. So let's start with <clears throat> what's your number? Now, most people, I'm sure you're all thinking, well, my, I collect uh, you know, a million dollars during the year, or I paid $5,000 in tax, but that's not the number that I'm referring to, okay? These two sets of numbers are extremely important in order to take advantage of a new tax law that was put into play two years ago, okay? So let's start with these, two, these numbers. What we're looking at here is taxable income, okay? Why is taxable income an important number? <clears throat> it's an important number because it drives our next, you know, it drives our next slide, okay? 
Qualified business income deductions. This is huge, okay? It is essentially, I'll go through some of the slide in a little more detail, but it's a free deduction that you're able to take simply by having uh, a practice or a business. Now, unfortunately, accountants like myself, lawyers, and dentists did not a great job lobbying the government because we've got we've got boundaries as to how we're able to take this deduction. So, as I mentioned before, a couple slides back, these numbers are your taxable income numbers that are very important. Okay, so we're going to keep these in mind for a second: three hundred twenty thousand four twenty for married filing jointly, and one hundred sixty and two ten. All right. So the 20% qualified business income deduction, it's available to sole proprietors, LLCs filing as an S corp or a partnership or a single member LLC or S corporations alone. It is not available to C corporations, okay? See, if you're a C corporation and you're a dental practice, you really wanna to speak to your CPA about that because there are very, very few reasons why you should be a C corp. I understand that the rate changed and it's 21%, but in reality, there's double taxation and different issues with having C corps. So we'll touch on that a little bit later towards the end when we talk about entity, different entity structures. But let's talk about how this works. <clears throat> okay, so if you're a dentist, obviously, which hopefully I assume you all are, and your taxable income is less than $321,000. So let's talk about taxable income. It is on your joint tax return with you and your spouse. So your capital gains, your interest and dividends from your uh, investments, your spouse's income, all add together to create <clears throat> your taxable income number. Okay, so the first thing to look at is that taxable income. But you're obviously going to say to yourself, well, how do I know what my taxable income is? I don't find that out until I do my tax return. That's the point. Okay, the point is that the really one of the only people that are going to tell you that number is your accountant and your CPA. Because in doing a tax projection, you need to know where that number stands now. Okay, it's very important now. So here's an example. Okay. If I do a projection and we look at it, married filing joint return and the taxable income before the QBI, which is the qualified business deduction. You heard me use QBI as the reference. If my partnership income is $200,000, okay, and that would mean the other 75 might come from a spouse's wages, you know, works outside the practice. But because that taxable income is below 321,000, I'm able to take my partnership, which is my dental income of $200,000, multiply it by a straight 20%, I get a free $40,000 deduction, simply by having my income below that threshold. Okay, that's $9,600 of, of federal savings right there. Okay, $9,600 of federal savings, <clears throat> you know, at the tax bracket, which that $275,000 know, would be in. So right off the bat, my taxable income jumps from 275 down to 235, again, simply because my income is down there. So we're gonna, we're gonna keep an eye on that. So if our taxable income is between 321 and 421, we get the same type of deduction, but it starts to get limited. So when you start at a full 20%, at 321,000, work your way up to 421. By the time you get to 421, it's zero. So you get zero deduction. And we're going to talk about the strategies to help you there. So right in between those, you'll get about 50% of the deduction. All right. So now we're going to get into some planning aspect of it. <clears throat> Hopefully your income is over the 421. Okay. Practice is doing well, having some good years. And now we're looking at if we are over 421,000, how do we work on getting that below it? So if our taxable income before QBI is at 425, we get zero QBI deduction. Okay. My partnership income is 300,000, 20% of 300, well, it would be a number, but since I'm over that threshold, I get nothing. 
So what can be done in this situation? Okay, and this is important. So at this time of year, you've spoken to your CPA and your CPA says, hey, listen, you're doing great, having a great year, your income's at 425, but unfortunately, you're not getting any benefit from the QBI deduction or the 199A deduction, okay? That's also what it's called. It's the, the code section of the Internal Revenue Code. So let's look here, okay? 420,000, let's just say that's your taxable income. I make a $10,000 purchase. I can be buying supplies. I can buy equipment. I can buy cabinets. I can spend the money on additional retirement payment, okay? Any expense to get me $10,000, we're gonna talk about section 179 and how to utilize that and how to take that one time right off in a couple slides, okay? So when I do that, I first, my 20% becomes, you know, not quite 20% because I'm limited up at that high level, but I get $1,900 worth of deduction. And therefore, my $10,000 purchase really turned into a $11,900 purchase, saving me tax on that purchase of 42%. And if you remember from a couple slides back, there is no 42% bracket. So I'm getting that additional piece of the deduction. So now let's look at the last column there, okay? I got a $420,000 of net income, uh, of taxable income, excuse me, okay? And I speak to my Henry Shine rep and I say, how do I possibly get this down? And lo and behold, I need to purchase a, a steric machine, okay? So I go and look at that for $100,000. Well, now we've gotten to like that magic territory. I've taken from 420 and I've dropped my income to 320 with the ability to write that off in one shot. And by doing that, I now have opened the doors to a full 20%. So now I'm able to get, or almost 19, uh, 20%, but I'm getting an additional $19,000 um, QBI deduction. Okay, so my $100,000 purchase got me almost $120,000 deduction, okay? So it's worth more to me than just that 100,000. However, on the far right-hand side, under the tax savings as a percentage of the purchase, you can see that the purchase loses its luster a little bit. And the reason that happens was back at that early screen when we looked at the tax brackets. When we jump from bracket to bracket, now what I've done is I've taken myself from the 37% bracket or close to it at the top, or the 35% bracket, and I've jumped down a couple brackets, which then I'm not saving as a percentage as much, but obviously the dollars have gotten a little bit bigger. Okay, so the important thing here is, number one, we need to find out, are we eligible to get this QBI deduction or are we not? If we're not, well, then it's a time, an opportunity to look into what can we do and this kind of goes along, along this whole webinar, what can we do before the end of the year to get the number into that QBI wheelhouse, if you will? Okay, so a couple other things. If, if your business has a loss, then that loss carries to next year, okay? If you're not able to take it, sort of ignoring basis issues there, and it does not reduce self-employment uh, income, okay? The, it, so we just need to keep an eye out for that. But on an high level view, okay, you just want to make sure that you're having the conversation with your CPA, hopefully your dental CPA, am I getting a QBI deduction? You should be able to ask that question. If your CPA, if your CPA does not know what QBI is, then you should find a new CPA. That's <laughs> to start with right there. So some of the strategies we, we talked about there to get the number into that QBI wheelhouse <clears throat> was utilizing section 179. Okay, so section 179, you know, by definition, there on the, on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, allows a taxpayer to elect to deduct the cost of certain types of property on their taxes and in one year, essentially, okay? To capitalize it, goes on a depreciation schedule, but that, sec that code section in the Internal Revenue Code lets us take that deduction in one year. In 2018, that number was a million dollars. 
2019, it's gone up with inflation to a million twenty. So what does that mean? That means I can buy up to almost two, no, two point five million dollars worth of equipment, okay? And I could deduct a million dollars. However, and I'm going to go into this a little bit further, you cannot create a loss with Section 179. That's really important. You know? So again, we'll touch base uh, on that a little bit further also. So the other piece to the pie, okay, one way to write things off quickly is through Section 179. Another one is bonus depreciation. It's sort of like the sibling that no one knows about sometimes. And as you can see, it's going to phase out over the next couple of years. Okay. So section 179 and bonus depreciation can both be used for either new assets or old assets. So a quick question here, does the QBI apply to both cash and accrual based accounting? Yes, but it really, it's, it's on your tax return, how you're filing. Most people that even if you track it on an accrual basis, you're going to file a cash basis tax return. Um, but either way, cash or accrual, you still get the opportunity to make that deduction. But it's it all starts with your taxable income on your personal return, which is going to be cash basis because all individuals are cash basis. So hopefully that uh, helps uh, you understand that a little more. So under uh, bonus depreciation, you can actually deduct that same 100% that you could using Section 179. Now, if you bought, let's say you bought five pieces of equipment, okay, and you can choose to Section 179 or write off any one of those five, and it's not all or none. So let's say I bought a, a piece of equipment for $100,000. I don't have to take a $100,000 Section 179. I can take a $40,322 Section 179. So you can choose how much you want to take in order to see how much you need to minimize your taxes, especially when it looks at QBI. Because if we take too much, we may push ourselves into too low a bracket, although that you know sounds like a good thing, but you you lost some of the luster of taking that that deduction. So sometimes it's better to not do it, and uh, we'll, we'll kind of take a we'll take a peek at that and what's uh, the difference is a little more. So, section one seventy nine versus bonus depreciation. <clears throat> if I take section one seventy nine, I get taxable income of fifty thousand, bonus of fifty. As you can see, one seventy nine, I can only get to zero, but bonus depreciation, I can create a loss. Whether you can take the loss or not on your tax return depends on some basis uh, limitations. Definitely not going to get into that, but it's just something to look at and evaluate whether we take the big write off now or we spread it out over time. Okay, so let's look at potentially spreading that purchase over time. Many of you obviously borrow money in order to purchase some of these assets. And when we take the write off in one year, we then have, as you can see, that debt service continues for the next five or six years. So we create what's called phantom income <clears throat> because we have income in the practice, but we're not able to reduce the income because we used up all the deduction in the first year. Sometimes best way to go. You just need to evaluate it. But if you don't do that and we let it spread over, even though it's a five-year asset, it actually <clears throat> goes over six years, a little piece, then our depreciation mimics our debt service. And so a lot of people, you know, depending on your situation, of course, speaking with your own CPA, you know, will spread it over time. Because if you're getting a piece of equipment that hopefully is gonna increase your practice, bring you more revenue, then the taxes you save in this example in 2020 or 2021 could be in a higher bracket. So that's definitely something to, to look at. Okay, so between the Section 179 bonus depreciation, those are two ways that can reduce your QBI, reduce your, your taxable income, and therefore allow you to get a little more QBI. Okay? It does not matter when you make that purchase, except you need to make the, well, this is how Section 179 works. You need to have 
the piece of equipment installed and delivered, obviously, uh, delivered and installed by December 31st. So whether you buy it and have installed on January 1st of a year or December 31st of a year, you get the deduction in that year. But it's got to be during that period of time. You're not supposed to just have an invoice, okay? You need to have it plugged in, okay? So if you get a chair delivered and you can plug it in, then you can take the deduction, okay? So retirement is obviously another way, a retirement contribution to reduce your income, whether it's in the practice, and we'll look at different practice plans, or it's individually. So let's first look at <clears throat> individual retirement plans okay one that on your personal tax return you can do an ira on your return if you are not a participant in another plan or your spouse depending on your income level <clears throat> you can potentially do a traditional ira okay the maximum is six thousand dollars if you're under 50 years old or seven thousand dollars if you're over 50 years old you get to have that uh, a little bit of catch up money, okay? If you are a participant in a plan, and we'll talk about those plans, you can make what's called a non-deductible traditional IRA, okay? That's gonna grow, okay, well, back up. The deductible traditional IRA will grow tax deferred, meaning you will take a deduction now at your tax bracket that you're in now, but then before you're 70 and a half, you have to begin taking the money out okay they're called required minimum distributions and they have to begin to come out before the april 1st the year following the year you turn 70 and a half before april 1st it's an odd date for some reason but that's where it is and so um, if you don't take your required minimum distributions you are penalized half of the amount you were supposed to take so if you are currently 70 and a half and you're still practicing, or I shouldn't say it doesn't matter if you're practicing dentistry or not, 70 and a half, and you have IRAs or old 401ks, and you have not taken that RMD, required minimum distribution, you need to speak with your financial advisor because you don't want to, you did a good job saving the money, you don't want to give it up. So traditional IRA, it's tax deferred, going to grow tax deferred, not tax free, unlike a Roth IRA. A Roth IRA, okay, there are income limitations as to when you can contribute to a Roth IRA. And you hit those limitations pretty quickly, okay? Hopefully, all of you are above those limitations. And there is what's called a backdoor Roth, and we'll talk about that in one second. But the beauty of a Roth is that when you do get money in there, it grows tax free. So it is after tax dollars that grows tax free. However, you never need to take the money out. Unlike a traditional IRA, the money has to begin to come out at 70 and a half. A Roth, it doesn't. So it's a great estate planning tool to then be able to grow it your entire life, hand it down to the kids, and then they can grow it during their lifetime, you know, if that's money you don't need. If you have a non-deductible IRA, traditional, and you have no other IRAs, no other traditional IRAs, you can put money in there, six grand, and then convert it to a Roth, okay? Because you didn't get a deduction when it went in, and now you can convert it to a Roth and let it grow tax-free. So obviously talk to your financial planner about that. So with a practice or as an independent contractor, <clears throat> you've got the opportunity to do a SEP. Now you need self-employed income to do that. So if you are just a W-2 employee somewhere, you cannot do a SEP, okay? You are sort of at the mercy of the practice if they have a plan, or if they don't, you've got the IRA opportunity, okay? There is a big cost to a SEP. You need to pay in 25% of their salary. That's a big number, okay? Unlike, as we move down there to the 401k, you've got different opportunities there, okay? Most people, a lot of people, have what's called a safe harbor 401k plan, okay? What that does, if you're the owner, you can put money, you can put money into a, a 401k, limits are 19,000 uh, if you're younger than 50, 25,000, it's a, 
a $6,000 catch up if you're over 50, okay? But in order to maximize yourself, because you make much more money, hopefully, than the rest of your staff, it's called a, a top heavy plan. So to get around that, you can give the staff 3% of their pay, whether they put in or not, as long as they're eligible, okay? And there are eligible, different eligibility requirements, which you should, you know, you can speak with your retirement person, your, your TPA, your third party administrator. They're the ones that will facilitate that plan. And so if you're a 401k, you can put in your, let's just say you're under 50, 19,000. And then if I make upwards of 280,000, which is the limit for calculating retirement, I can match myself 3%. So I can get 3% of 280 plus the 19,000, okay? That gets me in like $25,000 under age 50, you know, from under 50 years old, which is great. Over 50 years old, you know, I'm getting a little over $30,000 in, um, which is, again, uh, a, a great little nest egg to, to put in there. You can also have what's called a Roth 401k. You don't get the deduction, but that money is growing tax-free. However, like other 401ks, it also has to come out by the time you turn 70 and a half, okay? So something to think about. But the 401k, let's call that the uh, foundation to a practice retirement plan. The deferral piece is the foundation, the 19,000 or 25. The next layer to that cake is the match, 3% or, okay, that's the safe harbor piece or a match, meaning you get a choice. You can do a match, if I put in 1%, me, the employee, then the employer has to match 1%. I put in two, two, three, three, but when I put in four or five or six, the practice caps at 4%. So if you have a staff that does not contribute much money, you may want to look into doing the 4% because you can get 4% for yourself while not having to give the staff uh, a lot of money. <clears throat> but you know, as a fringe benefit, or you want to encourage savings, you know, you could also just do the safe harbor and look at the 3%. So first layer is the deferral of a 401k. Second layer is that match or safe harbor. The third layer is a profit sharing plan, okay? That allows you to get upwards of, if you're under 50 years old, $56,000. Now, it is not an additional 56. It is 19 plus the match, plus about 36,000 is the profit sharing piece, okay? You need to run those through actuarial calculations. It looks at the age of your employees, it looks at their wages, and then compares them all, how close you are to retirement. Um, and they work well if you're the older doctor and you have younger staff, okay? So, but if you're the younger doctor and have older staff, sometimes those will work, and some new comparability plans or, you know, traditional, you need to kind of have the numbers run to see if it makes financial sense for you to get there. The last retirement piece are pension plans or cash balance. Cash balance piece is a hybrid between a pension plan or an old school defined benefit and a 401k, meaning those first three layers we just talked about, getting to the uh, 401k, then the match, then the profit sharing. Let's just say that's 56,000 I can get in. Great number. But kind of going full circle, I need a $100,000 deduction to get my QBI number where I want it. So what can I do? I can put in place a cash balance plan, okay, which is another layer to that cake, make a large contribution, and therefore reduce my taxable income down to a level where I can get the QBI. So retirement plans are, are great because clearly we're getting money in for ourselves. We're letting it grow tax deferred over time or tax free, you know, depending on um, if we're in a Roth. But we're also, if we go into a 401k profit sharing cash balance, we're giving ourselves the opportunity to reduce our income further and possibly get that QBI deduction. So similar to when we looked at using section 179 for that $100,000 purchase a couple of slides ago, I can make a $100,000 retirement contribution and 
you know, potentially get myself in that same position. There is a kicker to it, obviously, okay? <clears throat> Going to that level of cash balance plans has some different rules. Number one, you have to do it for multiple years. You cannot do a cash balance contribution for one year. So you're committing yourself uh, to make that contribution. Maybe not at that level, um, but a significant contribution, okay? Also, <clears throat> you need to have really good cash flow in the practice because in order to do that, we need to be able to fund it year after year, okay? So if you're looking into a cash balance, especially nowadays if you are a specialist, okay? If you're a specialist, even if you're old or young, the seven to 10 year age gap works well. In fact, I was talking to an endodontist today that is 42 years old and has a staff that is about 24, 25 years old, some assistants, and he's gonna be able to get in about $110,000 into that cash balance plan on top of on top of the profit sharing and everything he's already making. So that's a significant number, you know, especially at his age, to be able to put into a plan. So especially if you're behind on retirement contributions and you've now you know, built up your practice and have excess cash, a cash balance is something to look at, okay? So let's talk about a cost segregation. Now, oftentimes when I'm speaking in public to people in the audience, I'll, how many people have heard of a cost segregation? And usually about four out of 30 people raise their hand that they've heard of it. So I'll make that same assumption now, that not many of you have heard of what cost segregation is, <clears throat> okay? So cost segregation is really, if we break it down, segregating the cost of a building or build out, okay? Because when you purchase a building, and if you've done a building, I'm sorry, if you've bought a building or built a building in the last five years, pay attention, okay? Because this is important, okay? If you did that, your building is depreciating at over 39 years. That's a long period of time to depreciate, to write off that, that building. Those were the rules, and they still are the rules. But how do we get around that a little bit, okay? Cost segregation is a detailed engineering approach, okay? You don't really wanna do this yourself, okay? I can talk to the plumber and the electrician, and I can find out some breakdowns, but that plumber and electrician are not gonna back me up in an audit. So let's look at the benefits. So let's start with a building at a million dollars. If you buy that million dollar building, okay, you can see on the top there, we would depreciate it over 39 years. Very common. I mean, that is the, the, the depreciation. Now, I'm using a commercial building. If it's a residential building, it would depreciate over 27.5 years, but this applies to that also. So again, if we're in a room, I would look at the room we're in and I would say, hey, there's a drop ceiling in this room we're speaking to, okay? When I buy the building, that drop ceiling, well, that's 39 years, right? That's part of the building. But in reality, I can take those little squares and leave the building, okay? So therefore, the engineering team goes in and starts to segregate, separate the cost of that entire purchase. And they look at light switches and they look at dental uh, electric and dental plumbing. And what I mean by that is, if you go into a building, you need to do different plumbing than me, the accountant needs. I need bathrooms, I need overhead lights, I need a sink in the kitchen, but that's it, right? I don't need the operatories. I don't need the, you know, dig up the ground and put all the electrical work underneath the floor. You do. Okay, so because of that, we're then able to segregate, we being the, well, the engineering team does it, not me, but into, you can see there, five year, seven year, 15 year, okay? So in this particular example, all right, you can see that we're able to pick up additional depreciation during that uh, period of time, okay? So in the early years, we want to create more depreciation to allow us to A, clearly pay less taxes, <clears throat> but not have to wait 39 years. So let's look at build outs, which are often more common, <clears throat> okay? So we look at the build out, 
$500,000 build out, meaning we're in the space, we don't own it, we're going to pay $500,000 or leasing to build out the space. <clears throat> now, I did not mention Section 179 when we we're talking about inside the building, okay? Because the realty company that might own the building cannot use Section 179. However, if you're the tenant or the practice is the tenant and you have a realty company that is owned you know, separately, now if the practice is the one doing this purchase, <clears throat> now you've got the opportunity to maybe utilize Section 179. So let's look here, $500,000 build out, right? I built on you know, six more ops and I changed the office around and of all the stuff I did, 230,000 of it was able, I was able to get into a five or seven year property. <clears throat> and so just using five or seven year property, you can see in year two, that total depreciation with the study, $80,000. So meaning in year two, I could get $80,000 worth of a deduction compared to 12 otherwise. Big difference. Why is that important? Well, again, that 80,000 could push me into a level where I can make use of QBI, okay? And how do I know if I'm close to it? A tax planning and tax projections. Again, we're going full circle here, right? <clears throat> it's all going back to not only saving taxes, which is great, but getting that free deduction just helps that much more, <clears throat> okay? And when the practice is doing the purchasing or the tenant improvements. Now we've got the ability to use 179. And in this example, I'm not using the 179, as you can see the five and seven year property, but I could blow out 230,000. I cannot create a loss in doing it, but I, can, but I can take that deduction. So the cost segregation is important <clears throat> if you know how to use it. So I love this, this slide, okay? This really lays it out well. Typically, a cost segregation costs about seven to ten thousand dollars, depending on um, how big the project is. Okay, so when I do that cost seg, I'm really just pushing all the deductions into the early years. I'm getting the same amount of deduction, but I don't have to wait 39 years to get it. And so the beauty of getting it in the early years are, I'm probably going to create a loss. Okay. And that loss <clears throat> is typically in a regular realty company, what's called a passive loss, because you're a dentist, you're not a real estate person. And so therefore, it's considered passive income or passive loss. It can only be offset against other passive income, like uh, another realty company or um, investment companies that you're involved in that you're not actively participating in. But in order to gain that benefit, okay, and be able to utilize the depreciation in a realty company against the income of the practice, you do we do what's called aggregation, okay? And what that does is we aggregate, we combine only on the tax return the realty company, if you own the property, and the dental practice. So they're separate entities. Let's just call the realty company an LLC, okay? Let's call the practice an S corporation. The S corporation, let's just say, has $300,000 of net income. And by doing a cost segregation <clears throat> uh, and creating large deductions, I have a $100,000 loss inside of my realty company. If I did not aggregate, I may not be able to combine them. I would still be taxed on my 300,000 and my 100 gets suspended inside of my tax return, okay? But if I aggregate them, I now only pay tax on $200,000, 300 from the practice minus my 100 from the realty company, okay? So aggregation, which is an election on your tax return, allows you to combine those um, those two entities and therefore make use of that uh, of that deduction okay so family on the payroll very interesting so most people um, 
will look at uh, off well, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of people have their spouse help them out in the practice, which is great. Uh, no more trustworthy person, okay? But if I do not have a retirement plan and I hire my spouse and I pay her $30,000, I'm not saving anything. In fact, I'm wasting Medicare and Social Security money because if I simply pay myself more and I'm already over the Social Security limit, all I'm paying is Medicare. However, if I have a retirement plan in place, now is the opportunity to pay your spouse, right? Most likely, you know, she's met the qualifications inside your practice. Usually it's older than 21 years old, been there a year, and worked a thousand hours. So you might say, well, my spouse doesn't really work in the practice. Well, okay, she may work uh, for the practice in different ways helping send out mailings, um, uh, helping be a shoulder to cry on, whatever it may be. She helps enough to be, she or he to, depends um, enough to be able to pay that spouse, let's call it $30,000 or $25,000, okay? But if I defer $19,000 into a retirement plan, now I'm only getting taxed on four, or, you know, in that case, $6,000 minus some payroll taxes, all right? So I'm saving a significant amount of money. So many people have their spouse in the payroll, but it's children on the payroll that is kind of a little bit different. Now, the key is for any employee, you cannot pay them once a year. You know, that's the important thing. So remember that. Children on the payroll, you cannot go to December 15th and look at your income statement and see, oh no, I have more profit than I thought. I'm going to pay little Johnny you know, $20,000. Doesn't work that way. So years ago, we actually went through an audit with children on the payroll. And we went through several different levels because we believed that the kids should be on the payroll. And they had, uh, they had helped become the janitor. They had helped with computer issues. They did enough to be able to justify it. When it got all the way actually to the Court of Appeals, the judge said one thing. It was not the fact that you paid the kids. It was not the fact that that um, you know they did little work to earn their six or eight thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars. It was the fact in that instance that they were paid once a year, because clearly they were not doing jobs during the year. It was there. <clears throat> excuse me. It was there for the tax deduction. The limits for a standard deduction just increased to about to twelve thousand dollars. So you can pay <clears throat> anyone. $12,000, and if that's their only income, they will not pay any federal tax. Now, there are different states, you know, and I know people all over the country listening, so <clears throat> you have to look at your, your state limitations. But for federal, you can pay them up to $12,000. So how do you justify it, and at what age, okay? If you've got a one- or two-year-old, difficult to justify what they're doing on the payroll. However, <clears throat> if you, on your website, have them there, and they're modeling, you can go out, find out what a local modeling fee is, $2,000, $3,000, and you could pay them that, not through a 1099, not as independent contractors. Got to be on payroll. <clears throat> By doing that, you reduce your taxable income of the practice and then put it onto their separate tax return. But if they're making under $12,000, they won't pay tax anyway. Okay, so if you're at the 35% bracket, you know, you're saving $3,500 in taxes on your tax return and not picking up any on the kids. So as the kids get older, they can clearly do more, okay? Uh, Facebook and Instagram and all of those type things which you're utilizing for marketing purposes, a lot of practices have what we'll call social media coordinators, okay? You have a job description for the kid. They're maintaining your web page. They're maintaining your, your social media presence. And we're gonna pay, let's say, my 18-year-old son, I'm gonna pay him $15,000, or let's just say 20,000, because when I researched what it would take for a marketing company to do it, you know, that was their annual fee for the year. Great, okay, I've got justification as to why I'm paying that, and I've got a job description you know, written down. <clears throat> So I'm going to pay my son 20000 okay? He's not going to pay tax on the first 12 of it. And then for the next piece, 
he's going to pay tax at probably a 10% level. Very low. But if he's going to college, I'm going to give him money anyway. So now, essentially, I've made my college payments tax deductible. Why? I've written through payroll checks to my son. It's deposited into his account. It cannot go into your account. And then out of his account, we've written checks to pay the tuition. Okay, so now I've created earnings for him, but in reality, it's going into his account, and then from there, out to college, and now I've made those college contributions, those college tuition payments, I should say, um, tax deductible. On top of that, by doing that, <clears throat> he then's eligible for an education credit. So he will really pay no tax on money, you know, up to $25,000, $30,000 with an education credit, with the first $12,000 uh, being taken up by the standard deduction. So it's a great strategy. You need to look at it and understand, but the key is you've got to pay them like every other employee. Okay, so other items we can look at are sort of discretionary expenses, okay? These are expenses that, you know, there's the white and the black, and you as the taxpayer, you're probably gonna function somewhere in the gray, but in the white, we're not taking any deductions, right? We're very, very conservative. In the black, you're gearing for an audit, right? You don't wanna be there, the accountant's not gonna sign that return, and uh, you just don't wanna be in the black. You wanna function somewhere in the gray that you can justify. If you have multiple offices, you should have auto expenses. You should have your car in the books. You appreciate that. You know, I didn't go into large uh, purchases of cars, you know, in, in a section 179, that gets a little deeper. So in these auto expenses, I'm really referring to gas and uh, tires and maintenance. And so <clears throat> you wanna be able to, um, you wanna be able to look at uh, the, you know, look at your car you're using your business. Now, the key with a car is your commute from home to the office is not deductible. But it's not really home to office. It's really your first business stop of the day. So let's just say that the bank is right next to my house and my office is 20 miles away. So I'm gonna stop at the bank every day. My house to the bank, not deductible. But bank to office now makes my car deductible. And on the way home, I need to stop at the post office, deliver the mail. I will drive from the office to the post office, deductible, but the last commute from the post office to my house, not deductible, okay? So a lot of it goes into documentation also. You wanna make sure the more you document, the more you can justify the expense, okay? So charitable contributions. With the new tax laws, there's the standard deduction has been increased, and a lot of people are not getting benefits from their charity, okay? If you don't have a mortgage, and if you don't have a mortgage anymore, and you're getting limited on your $10,000 of, of taxes, you need to give a lot of money before you get a deduction. Therefore, look at the charity as a marketing opportunity. Write the check from the business account, maybe write a letter, have your logo, make sure it's there, and when you make that donation, make it from the practice, and now we're getting 100% deduction for that charity, but it's really marketing, right? You want that person at the charity to say, great, you know, Mark Rosen, DMD PC, has given us something, you know, that's a dentist uh, locally, and now you've marketed uh, that way. Meeting, seminars, travel, <clears throat> those are opportunities um, to take, you know, different deductions. Everything should have a business purpose to it, okay? Meals are still a 50% deduction, and it's all meals. Actually, meals in the office are a 50% deduction. They've taken away entertainment. Golfing, tickets to games, season tickets are now not deductible, which is unfortunate. I'm a golfer, so I'm a little disappointed with that. But, you know, that's no longer deductible. But everything on discretionary expenses, the important thing is documentation. Okay, if you're going to travel to go see a dental school buddy in New York, and I'm located in Massachusetts, I'm going to take the train there. When I get there, I want to make sure when I leave that I'm getting the opportunity to see his office. He writes a letter to me, Mark, thank you for the opportunity to come to my office. You know, 
potentially will partner in the future. And now what have I done? I can write off my train, I can write off my stay, and I've proven what the business purpose was of my trip. So definitely something to look at, okay? As we mentioned a minute ago, donations as marketing. You know, looking at that and not wasting, um, you know, you wanna to give to charity out of the goodness of your heart, awesome, and we, you should do that. But if we're not getting a deduction for it, because depending where your, your tax uh, situation is, if you don't have a mortgage uh, payment, and you just have taxes, you're gonna get that $24,000 benefit uh, as a um, your standard deduction if you're no longer itemizing. So something to look at. The last piece I wanna go into is entity choice. And then we're gonna open it up for, for more questions um, afterwards. But entity choice makes a big difference when we're looking at QBI, okay? And a circle back, which I didn't mention there, all those discretionary deductions or family on the payroll, okay, all do what? They reduce your taxable income. By reducing the taxable income, you're then giving yourself the opportunity to get a QBI deduction. So a QBI deduction is that net income of the practice, okay? Number two there, C Corp can't get QBI. But from a sole proprietor, excuse me, S Corp, LLP or LLC, then it's really your the net income of the practice and in an S-Corp situation after you've taken salary, okay? Very important. Sole proprietor, you really you don't have any liability protection. No one should really be a sole proprietor now. You should get that into, jumping across the street there, if you will, a single member LLC functions the exact same way as a sole proprietor, but it's got limited liability protection, meaning if someone sues the entity, they can't come after your house, okay? So you wanna speak with your lawyer about that. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm not a lawyer, um, so keep an eye on that. But these are the different entity structures. Going back to what I said very early on, if you're a C-Corp, ask your CPA why. Why are you still a C-Corp? Because that conversion to an S-Corp <clears throat> will not only help save you taxes, it's also gonna be better when you go to sell. So something to look at. Before I go any further, um, my CPA firm is a member of what's called the Academy of Dental CPAs. Everywhere there's a star is an ADCPA member. You can look us up on the website. We represent about 9,000 dentists amongst the entire group, and they all do exactly what I do. In fact, we just met in Fort Worth, Texas last week to go over different planning opportunities, different things in your industry for us to better understand. So if you want to contact your local dental CPA or someone covers that territory, you can reach out to any, any member there. Okay, so now I'll sort of leave it at questions and leave it here for a moment. So um, question is, can the same thing be done for private high school? Um, I assume that's in reference to um, paying your child. So if I pay my child in a custodial account, they're under, let's say 18, and I deposit money in their account, I can use it for anything. I can put the money into a 529 plan for college. I can pay my son's um, you know, basketball club team. It's their money. It can be used for anything. It's a custodial account. So I can save it. I can put it into a Roth IRA for them. You know, That's a great opportunity because to put money into a Roth IRA, you need earned income. So since I've paid them through the practice, they now have earned income and therefore can contribute to a Roth IRA, let it go for their whole lifetime, tax-free, which is, which is huge. 529 plan, which is an educational savings plan. You know, I'm not gonna go much into that. So yes, it can be used in the, in the private school. So I don't know if there are any other questions. If there are not, I'll leave the opportunity. All right. Um, so the, the, uh, the question is, can, you, can I explain again what goes into the QBI calculation? It's really quite simple, okay? If you look at the net income of your practice, so let's just say it start with, if you're a single member LLC, okay? You function as a sole proprietor. On your tax return, you are filing a Schedule C, and you collect a million dollars, and all your expenses are 700,000, let's say $600,000, <clears> 
and you net 400,000, okay? At $400,000, well, actually, let's do it a little simpler. Let's say million dollar practice, $700,000 in expenses, your net income is 300, okay? You now get 20% of that 300,000, your net income. If you're an S corporation, looking at the same thing, collections of a million dollars, we now need to subtract your salary. And so our, if our salary was, let's say, 100,000, and then our net income is 200,000, then you will only get a QBI deduction against that 200,000, not the 300 combined. So that makes a difference in entity choice. Because if that same thing, if that same practice were a single member LLC, I would get a bigger deduction. Okay, but but the important thing is I cannot take that S corp and give myself a ten thousand dollars salary because the government's going to call that unreasonable compensation. Also, if I have a retirement plan, I can only match ten thousand dollars three percent. I'm not getting much money in the retirement plan. So it's a little bit of a balancing act if you have an S corp when looking at QBI. You need to give yourself a reasonable salary. And if you're in that threshold down there, you want to make sure and see how much QBI you can give yourself. So you need to keep an eye on that. If you've been looking to convert to an S Corp, you want to evaluate or have your CPA evaluate, is it worth converting? Meaning, are you going to limit your QBI if your income is at that level? So we need to, you need to keep an eye on that. It's a, a little more... <clears throat> involved than it used to be you know by being a an s corp you know you can save on medicare taxes and potentially social security depending on how high your salary is but you got to watch that qbi deduction <clears throat> okay so our final question of the night is can leased items be deducted yes but you simply are deducting the lease payments okay you don't get to if the if it's worth you know a hundred thousand dollars but you're paying a lease payment like a lease car, you're writing off a piece, whatever you're paying in that lease payment. Unlike if you purchase the item and it's yours at the end of the loan, then you can write off the whole item. So first, again, thank you very much for, for attending. We're actually going to be doing a series during the year. This is the first uh, of, of the series. The next one probably in March and then June, uh, different topics that were, are relate, uh, relevant at that time. So thanks, Henry Schein, for allowing me to do this. And I appreciate you joining. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you, Mark. And for those of you that did ask questions that we did not get around to, we will um, communicate with Mark after the fact and get back to you on those. I would like to personally thank you and Mark for attending. We really appreciate your time and participation. If you have additional questions and you would like to get in touch with Henry Schein, Equipment and Technology Specialist, to learn more about adding to your practice and taking advantage of section 179, please visit us at henryshinedigital.com slash tax. That's henryshinedigital.com slash tax. You will all be receiving a link to view the recording of today's presentation in the coming week via email. On behalf of Henry Shine, thank you, Mark, for an amazing webinar, and thanks so much once again for all of you for attending. Have a great night.